If you like our content, please like, subscribe, and click the notification bell to get alerts when we introduce new videos. In this module, we're going to take a look now at the BLE protocol stack and uh, general capabilities and how the BLE interface is integrated within the Ruckus IoT suite. So as we look at the, uh, the BLE capability and the BLE stack uh, at a high level, that one of the key things to understand is that Bluetooth actually works on multiple layers, as with uh, Zigbee or any other uh, normal protocol. The hosted control interface defined within the, uh, the BLE application typically will use a standard API and there is a, an industry standard or a, an open source BLE driver called BlueZ which uh, is actually a very well-defined and easy to use software API to interface to BLE applications and BLE uh, solutions. At a Mac layer, the uh, the Mac itself is specifically defines a number of, uh, of capabilities, including the ability to be an end device uh, gateway and also things like the hub and spoke technology. So from the hub to connect to each or, each or multiple devices on the outside. The Mac itself uses a six byte Mac address and uh, is designed around a reliable packet exchange with uh, 128 bit AES encoded data. On a physical layer, the, uh, the BLE stack and BLE radio uses a 2.4 gigahertz PHY with a one megabit per second approximate data rate. These are split in the BLE band to provide three beacon channels. And these are a much narrower channel with 37 narrow band two megahertz channels available as well. Beacon traffic also uses adaptive frequency hopping uh, as needed, uh, a lazy acknowledgement with a 24-bit CRC, 32-bit MIC, and narrow band negotiation for uh, data transfer. The key thing, though, is when we look at IoT in general and BLE, we tend to tend to find that BLE is used mostly for beaconing applications, for applications to uh, to transmit consistent data to be used within different uh, different applications and use cases. So when we look at different applications with BLE in IoT, the, the first one that really springs to mind is real-time location services or, or asset tracking. The ability for a low-cost device to transmit information that is unique to that device, which is then picked up by hubs or, or gateways throughout a building to determine approximate location of that device. So it's really designed to provide a, an approximate uh, distance using RSSI measurements of where that device is in proximity to gateways or to hubs within the building. And by using the, uh, the approximate distance and also the location of those hubs, you're able to say that this device is in approximately this location. The higher the density of devices, then you also gain the ability to do trilateral or triangulation to now start to get a much closer or more accurate position of where that device is within a building for real-time location services. Another application where we can use the similar approach is geofencing. So in a situation where we want to detect if something leaves a building or leaves a specific location, we can use a tag attached to a, a, a mobile device, either a person or an asset, and actually then detect when that device has transitioned past a threshold or past a, uh, a specific location. Or alternatively, we can just say this device has disappeared from our network. So we're able to then look at the uh, historical data of where that device was and say, you know, the device has now left from this location at such a period of time. And we can trigger some kind of an alarm or notification indication that uh, that, that geofence event has happened. Another thing we can use BLE for is for condition monitoring. So by utilizing some small sensors, uh, temperature, humidity, CO2, vibration, tilt, uh, or even a panic button, we're able to gather that information on a tag and then use the BLE radio to transmit that information from the tag through the network and into uh, into our back-end service. So we're able to use BLE very much like we would for Zigbee for data gathering, but we're able to also then use that and store that information on the tag over a long period of time and then do a very quick data upload uh, when needed. One of the key things then to look at really, in addition to the applications, might also be the vertical 
that is uh, is using or, or wanting to use BLE. And if we take a BLE use case and apply them to each of the key verticals, we can see where where that might be useful to use BLE uh, in, in different applications. So in an education environment, we want, may want to use BLE for automatic roll call. So we can detect when somebody has entered a classroom and automatically enroll them and say that they're in that location uh, for auto enrollment. And also to then say, well, that person has been in the room for the duration of the class, therefore they can get credit for that. We can do things like asset tracking. So, you know, where are my iPads or my, my tablets? Where are my computers? Where are where's the projectors and this kind of equipment level? We can gather a, a much better insight into where those devices are throughout the building. We can do geofencing and detect if a device has left the building or a, a student has left uh, outside of a, a specific time zone. And as well as providing things like panic button location. So by utilizing the, the tag with a panic button or a button on it, we can actually now say this, this person in this location has pressed the panic button and we can go in and, and assess what's going on. In a hospitality arena, we can use similar approaches. So the same technology actually now could be used in, in a different use case and provide the same functionality. So again, panic buttons would be a, a useful asset and a useful capability. Guest marketing might also be another opportunity. So when people come in, they can get information about how to access the wireless network, how to gather information about the state of, of their the, the hospital or the state of the environment or the state of the uh, the application within the, uh, within the hospitality arena. We can also have things like like auto check in and check out. So again, utilizing a VIP application and utilizing the beacon, we're able to, as the as the user walks into the building, they're able to automatically detect that, that, uh, that they're in the reception and send their key card directly to their phone. And then we can also do things like room service monitoring as well. So we can look at the, the, the staff members, we can see that they've gone into a room, we can detect that they've cleaned the room and when they've left the room, that room can automatically now be uh, indicated as being serviced, cleaned and ready to be reassigned. In a healthcare arena, we can also use similar technology. So again, we can do equipment location. So where is the ECG monitor? Where's the nearest defibrillator to my location? We can use the tag in combination with the gateway to find assets and, and locate them as, as, uh, as quickly as possible within, a, within the environment. Again, we can do geofencing. So ensuring that equipment hasn't left the building, hasn't left uh, a surgical environment, things like that. Condition monitoring, again, in, in a medical environment, we may want to add tags to medicines to make sure that they have stayed within the tolerance for temperature, humidity, environment, vibration. We can gather all that information and provide a, a chain of custody for that information and for that, that medical equipment during uh, post-transit. And then we can also, in, in more of an assisted living environment, we can also do things like fall or assistance detection. So, you know, we can have panic buttons, but also we can have the uh, an automatic detection of somebody falling over to trigger an alarm and to send assistance to that person as needed. And then another vertical that we can use BLE, it would be in, in an MDU environment. So again, we can use this for building and environment monitoring. We may also want to do building management uh, we may want to gather information from a managed services perspective and, and start to look at uh, you know, different environmental conditions and uh, environment data, uh, temperature, humidity, CO2 could all be managed within a BLE environment as well as things like asset tracking. And, things like that. and then on top of that, we, we can use BLE for access control. So there are a range of, of door locks that use Bluetooth, which means we can connect them to the controller and we can provide access control over a BLE uh, network. So one of the key things to look at when, when looking at BLE is obviously if we're looking in a beacon, beaconing environment is that there are a lot of beacons out there and they have different tools and backend services and management that allows us to configure the beacon for our specific use case. Um, and we have some that are proprietary where they may have a proprietary payload that maybe offers more capability, has their own, uh, their own backend service to decode that. Or they may be industry standard, so they may be working on Edistone or iBeacon payload, EUID type format, UUID formats. And those, uh, there are plenty of those available commercially that can will work and interact with the IoT controller. And the key thing here is any standard iBeacon, Edistone beacon will work within our the Ruckus IoT suite and provide us all of the same capabilities from asset tracking, location services, and uh, any of the outlined applications that we've, uh, we've discussed. So one of the key things to look at then is how do we configure the system to use BLE efficiently and effectively. So to do that, there's, there's a couple of things that we ideally want to do to, to start to use 
Bluetooth and beaconing within a, within an application that we would build a, a solution around. So the first thing to think about is is the information about where the access point is. So within the access point and the smart zone environment, we want to configure our environment and our application within smart zone to give us more information that we can specifically use in a, an asset tracking or in a BLE IoT arena. So we have a, a number of fields. One of them is the location field. This is a user definable field that can be used to tell the, the app access point where it is. So this is a text friendly field, for example, office or, or reception or room 101. And we can define that and that information will then be provided from the access point to the controller to tell the, the controller the location of that access point and therefore the beacon that that access point can see. We could also, if we want to do things like mapping and a larger area determination of, of devices, we can also use GPS coordinates. So the smart zone provides us the ability to configure and set the GPS coordinates of the access point. If it's a higher end access point with GPS on board, some of our outdoor APs, they already have GPS, they will automatically populate that field and, and provide that information. Then in addition to that, we also want to provide the floor. So, you know, where is this access point and therefore this location within the building? Is it the first, second, third floor or is it an altitude? So we can either set the, the floor in meters, feet, or we can set it as a, as a floor index. Then on top of that, we also need to configure the access point to, have, to enable BLE radio. And we do that to, um, to enable the access point to receive BLE, da BLE data from, uh, from the beacon. Once we've configured the access point, next thing we need to do is we need to configure our plugins. And the plugins that we're going to configure will really depend on, on the services that we want to use. So we can support iBeacon, Edistone types of payloads, and they will we will then determine if the incoming payload is an iBeacon or an Edistone, and then forward it to a destination URL, a destination server, a rules engine, cloud service, or whatever it is that we want to do. We can also filter out specific fields and we can look for specific payloads or UUIDs within our uh, incoming data stream. So we can search just for one vendor's specific beacon if, if that's what we want to do. And these are all configured within the IoT controller as plugins. And we'll cover each of these in detail later on in the, uh, the technical curriculum. And you'll see examples of how we can configure Eddystone iBeacon, Contact IO, Beacon as a Service, etc. And how you can configure those and then monitor and, and check that those are working. So in addition to iBeacon and Edistone, we also can support proprietary framing data from, from vendors like Contact IO. So we detect a Contact IO beacon and we're able to then forward that directly into their cloud and they can process that and display it within their application. Other things that we can do are things like beacon as a service. So rather than just detecting Bluetooth beacons that are in proximity to an access point, we can also turn our access point into a beacon. So we have the ability within the Ruckus IoT suite and within the, the access point and the IoT controller, we're able to switch on the Bluetooth radio in an access point and we can define what payload we want that access point to transmit. Now this could be really useful and interesting when we're doing wayfinding. So we can have an access point transmit a unique identifier that says, this is my UUID, this is my location, my major and minor bits, and therefore a mobile phone app can detect that beacon and it can say, okay, I've got this beacon ID. It can go to a backend server and it can say, okay, I now know I'm in this room because I can see this beacon. So it allows this system to be much more flexible in not only providing uh, you know, localized panic buttons or functionality, but also we can build up and provide beacon as a service and do wayfinding and location-based services. So when we actually look at the payload that's coming in from the IoT controller, we actually have a, a lot of information in there that we can now extract and decode in real time. So the, the message coming in from the IoT controller will be forwarded to our application or our service or our rules engine for us to deal with and process and, uh, and, and, and extract. So the, the one of the things that we can do is we can aggregate messages. So rather than every time we see a beacon, which could be every 100 or 200 milliseconds, we forward that, we can aggregate one access points beacon information together into one message every second. So every second we can get a, a pushed 
message from the IoT controller that gives us all the information about that access point, how many beacons it can see, the location of the access point, and uh, any any payloads that, that, that are visible. So here we have an example where we have a uh, an access point through the IoT controller forwarding into our rules engine, and our rules engine is now displaying that data. So we can see the, the payload has provided us with the location of the access point. So the AP location has been returned as the office, and this was set within the virtual smart zone. Additionally, it also now provides us with the latitude and longitude of that access point. Again, that was configured within the virtual smart zone, and the altitude is also in there, again, from the virtual smart zone. Within the payload, we also see the events field, which is an array. And if we open that array, you can see that there are five entries in there. Those are the five beacons that that access point is reporting that it has seen within that one second. So this is all referenced within the timestamp for that packet and that payload. And we can extract out that information and we can see all the information about that specific beacon. And we can see the data. So that's its payload, its type, its UUID, its major and minor uh, values, as well as its transmit power. We also get a timestamp of when that device was registered within the access point. We get to see the RSSI, which is an appro approximation of how far that device is from the access point. And then we get the device's EUID as well, or its MAC address uh, from that perspective. Now, the nice thing is, because we have recognized that this is a standard iBeacon or an Eddystone format, the payload is conforming to that standard. So what it means is that we can obviously decode that payload using any algorithms or any, any decoding UUID tools, but we can also encode data in there for example, things like panic buttons. And it becomes very easy for us now to monitor that payload and look for a bit that has detected a, a specific action. So within that, we're actually now able to start to build up some, some fairly complex applications and engines and rules within there. So for example, we can build an application now that detects geofencing. So we can see where a beacon is within a building. We can see if the beacon has disappeared or if it's, uh, if it's left from a specific location. And we can then trigger an alarm if that happens. We can do the same thing with white blacklisting. So we can say this device is in this location and we can check that against a list and say, is that a valid location or an invalid location? And if it's valid, we can say it's OK. If it's invalid, we can we can again trigger an alarm. We can detect panic buttons based on simple states. And again, all of these capabilities are available in any commercially available tags normally. We can also do things like beacon counting. So as we look at contact tracing and we can look at density, we're able to look at an access point and say, well, there are these number of beacons within close proximity. Therefore, there is a high density of people in this area that might be too high for uh, for the, the th rules or the threshold that's been defined. Or it might be that we want to monitor everybody and then at a later date, go back and, and instigate some kind of tracing to see who was in there when other people perhaps were 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 flagged as, as having an issue. Then on top of that, we can also feed all of that information into our location engine. So we can we can take a constant data feed from our IoT controller and we can detect new tags. We can detect if new phones or devices have entered into a building. We can also detect where that device is and we can determine the location, the time, how long it's been there. We can do heat mapping all by just being provided with this very simple level of data. We're able to build some very large and complex applications all based around Bluetooth. And then we, on top of that, we can add in environmental data and things like that as well to, to build out and add even more capability. So that completes our introduction to BLE and the Ruckus IoT suite and uh, how you can use BLE with the Ruckus IoT suite to now provide different applications and services. Mm -hmm.